Well, it is our 20th anniversary and we're celebrating by doing some series on our different values. And one of the things we're, we're talking about, I think our first series is called Worship is Our Highest Priority. Over the last couple of weeks, we've had some really good sermons. Uh, we've had sermons on, uh, Ryan preached on that uh, our worship needs to be fit for a king because when we come in here, worship doesn't begin. Worship's been going on in heaven 24 seven. We're actually entering into God's throne room and we are coming before a king and we need to approach him that way as we come in. Um, but he's not just a king. We learned in the second week that we can approach him uh, intimately. We can approach him and open up our hearts to him and allow him to see into our hearts. He is a loving father. Our king happens to be a father also, and we can approach him that way, uh, open and honest. And then Andrea last week, she did a great job, didn't she? Uh, it was just a good sermon on, on authenticity and how we need to worship the Lord with authenticity. And we value that as the vineyard, of being real and open, worshiping in spirit and in truth, worshiping with the core of who we are and also being truthful about where we're at in life. Now this week technically was scheduled when I wrote these out, uh, worshiping uh, with kingdom expectation, worshiping with an expectation that, that the next moment may be the moment when the kingdom of God breaks in and somebody gets saved or healed or, or you get delivered of something, you get set free from a habitual sin. You just have this sense that the rule and reign of God, that's what Jesus would call it, the rule and reign of God's in the room. And, and in a way, I will be talking about that and I think you'll see that. But as I was prepping and, and praying, I kept coming back to a, a piece of what Andrea talked about last week from Hebrews 13, 15, where it said that we're to offer a sacrifice of praise. That when we come to worship, it isn't just worshiping when we feel good, but it's worshiping even when it's tough. I mean, what happens when times are extremely tough? What if your mental battles are, are beating you up? Uh, what if an unbelieving spouse continually mocks your faith? What if you've been praying for years for an addicted child and not have seen no resolve? Or you're single and you've been praying for years for a spouse? Or or you want, to, to, you want to have a child and, and yet uh, the doctors have told you uh, it won't happen. Some folks in the room are probably here today and they're misunderstood. Others are, are just harassed by life or by people. Others may struggle with poverty continually. A few, I'm sure, in the room, have, they've received devastating news over the last few weeks or months. How do you worship then? Well, you come back to what she talked about last week, Hebrews 13, 15, that we can offer a sacrifice of praise, that part of what God calls us to do is to do something we can only do on earth that we will never get to do in heaven, which is to offer him a sacrifice of praise. Worship will not be a sacrifice in heaven. You will have a full-on experience of seeing God in all his glory. Your eyes will be wide open the whole time, and every glimpse you get of God, you'll just be inspired to worship. It'll be easy to worship. <laughs> But here, it can be tough at times, right? Here, you are being invited, I am being invited to worship God no matter what, and that's a sacrifice of praise when you get the devastating news, when you have been harassed all week, when the unbelieving spouse mocks you, you are being invited in to still worship and praise God because he deserves worship. Today, I'm weaving this idea of worshiping with kingdom expectation as well as a sacrifice of praise and, and I'm kind of weaving them together. And I really want to answer the question, what happens when we offer God a great sacrifice of praise? What happens when you and I choose to worship even if we don't feel like worshiping? Even if the toddlers have been up all night last night and we're pretty sleepy when we walk in the room, uh, what happens if we choose to press in? What happens to, when we choose to praise God uh, even when we got notice that we're going to be laid off? What happens then? What happens when we choose to press in and worship God no matter what? When a family member gets devastating medical news, what happens when we decide I'm going to praise God no matter what? Now, I am not talking about being inauthentic. I am not talking about putting happy clappy face on and, hey, praise the Lord, life's going great. No, 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 I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about acknowledging life sucks right now, but God deserves praise and I'm going to press in. I'm going to share my heart with him. I'm going to be real with him, but I'm going to worship. What happens when we do that? Well, we're going to look at a couple stories. Go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 16. 
It's actually the last story we'll look at today. For sake of time, I'm going to put the first story up on the, on the screen in a few moments. And we're going to just look at these stories and see what happens when somebody offers a sacrifice of praise. And the first thing we're going to look at is a literal sacrifice, a human sacrifice, sacrifice of divinity also. When Jesus is sacrificed on the cross for our sins, Take a look with me on the screen, Matthew 27 here. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over the land. This is as Jesus is being crucified. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, Laba Shathathani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's on the cross. He's been whipped. His back is wide open. He's being mocked by the very people he's came to save. He's got nails in his feet and his hands. And he offers in the midst of that his heavenly father a sacrifice of praise from Psalm 22. Now his, uh, his, his sacrifice of praise starts with a lament, which is still a form of worship and praise. He's crying out, where are you at, God? For the first time, God, in the human form of Jesus, for the first time God is feeling the effects of sin because he is absorbing every sin every human has ever committed. Think about how you feel after you sin. <laughs> Jesus takes that for everybody on the cross. Not only does he take all of that sin on his back and in his being, he also at the same time is taking out the justice of God because any wrongdoing needs punished. We know that in our judicial system. For a judicial system to be fair, it needs to punish wrong and evil. And so there's all this evil that has been done by humans and it needs justice. And in that moment, God himself in the form of Jesus absorbs all the justice and wrath of God on himself. So that's what he's feeling in the midst of this. And even in the midst of that, he can begin to offer a sacrifice of praise, starting with a lament. Now, scholars tell us that when Jewish rabbis would, would quote a scripture, um, particularly in written documents, that usually when it's quoted, it, it's really kind of a, a shrunk down, synthesized version of the whole chapter, that they're really t saying if they quote a verse, they're, they're really implying the whole chapter. And so if you read all of Psalm 22, you'll get that picture. But let's just look at a few verses of Psalm 22 right now, if we can bring that slide up. Psalm 22, 1 through 5 my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why are you so, so far away when I groan for help? Every day I call to you, my God, but you do not answer. Every night I lift up my voice, but I find no relief. And here's the sacrifice of praise. He's lamented. He's worshipped authentically, as we learned last week. He's worshipped in truth and integrity. He's not sugarcoating it. But here's the sacrifice of praise. Yet you are holy enthroned on the praises of Israel. You ever heard somebody say that God inhabits the praise of his people? It's that verse right there that it comes from. He's saying, I don't feel you right now, but I'm worshiping you anyway. You are holy, and yet I'm worshiping. I'm pouring out my heart to you, and I believe you're enthroned. You inhabit. You dwell in the very praises I'm giving you right now that you're here. It's a sacrifice of praise. Our ancestors trusted in you and you, were, and you rescued them. They cried out to you and were saved. They trusted in you and were never disgraced. If you would read the rest of the, the chapter, you'll see that it all applies to Jesus on the cross. He's quoting a passage a thousand years before he lived. And he's quoting it as his own worship song, a sacrifice, of praise. He's saying, it's bad right now. I feel forsaken by you. Yet I will praise you anyway. And as I praise you, I have expectation that you're going to be here. You're going to dwell in my praises. You're going to be here as I worship you. And not only are you going to be here, I know from other stories you have rescued my ancestors. I anticipate that somewhere down the line you will rescue me. But until then, I'm going to worship you. That's a sacrifice of praise. That's worshiping God no matter how you feel. What's the result? Well, let's, let's, let's just look at Matthew 27. 
what happens after this sacrifice of praise is offered. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now, if you don't know Jewish history, the temple had an inner sanctum where the Jews believed the very manifest presence of God, his glory, dwelt. And there was a thick curtain there. And at the moment of Jesus' death, the curtain is ripped in two. And it symbolized that God is not contained in this inner sanctum, this most holy place. But now, because of what Jesus has done on the cross, offered himself to absorb all the sins of humanity. Humans give him the worst they can give him, and he takes it in. God pours his justice and wrath out on Jesus. Jesus takes that in and pays our debt for us. Because of that, there is now a way that God is no longer restricted to some inner sanctum. He can be experienced by anybody, anywhere. He's available. That's pretty supernatural. Look at the next thing. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection, went into the holy city, appeared to many people. When the centurion and those who were with him were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and they exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. What happens when you give us... Sacrifice of praise, I think each and every time, whether you get to see it or not, because Jesus didn't get to see those things, right? He's, he's dead. Whether you get to see it or not, something supernatural happens when you offer a sacrifice of praise. I think all those things count as supernatural things. Can you imagine? Imagine we're having church and somebody does something here and we feel the earth shake and your cell phone starts lighting up and said, hey, Few people at Forest Rose came out of the grave and they're like downtown preaching. One of them's your grandpa. Nah, grandpa died 10 years ago. Hey, grandpa. Well, no, man, he's, he's down there, man. He's out in front of Ale House just preaching away. And like, there's, you know, your aunt, your great aunt's out over on the bandstand and like crowds gathering. That's supernatural. I think it's supernatural that a Roman centurion who was in charge of the execution goes from the belief, because this was the belief, goes from the belief that Caesar was God or that Caesar was a son of the gods. He goes from that, that after the sacrifice of praise, the centurion goes, that guy, that guy there is the son of God. So here's my belief. I think if we offer a great sacrifice of praise, then there is a release of great supernatural power. I think God inhabits the praises of his people and when you and I press in, no matter how we're feeling, and we press in and we offer a sacrifice of praise, God is there. And in that moment, something supernatural happens. You sense his presence. Or dead things come back to life. Or people who didn't believe see, see your witness that you were able to offer a sacrifice of praise even as you're being crucified. And they say, man, there's something godly about that. There's something real about that. There is a sacrifice of praise that is offered in those moments. And when that happens, there is a release of supernatural power. Now, does that mean everything's hunky-dory? No, please don't take that. Wasn't hunky-dory for Jesus. He still died. He still felt pain. And yet, something supernatural happened that changed people's lives. And we know the end of the story three days later that he gets resurrected. I know the end of your story that if you stay faithful to Jesus, you'll be resurrected and with Jesus in heaven. That doesn't mean you're going to miss out on pain when you offer a sacrifice of, pain, of praise. It does mean that that pain gets redeemed and something good comes out of it and supernatural power is released. See, this is our tension, Vineyard, in worship. Our tension is we will come in and say, sing songs like your love is relentless and you're awesome. Or we'll sing songs like how great is our God. We'll sing songs like our God is greater. Our God is awesome. Our God is healer. We sing that, right? We sing these great songs of a triumphant God. But we also sing songs like, broken, 
I run to you with my arms open wide. We sing songs like, whom have I but you? Though the mountains fall, they fall into the sea. Though my colored dawn turns to shades of gray, though my questions asked go unresolved. Feel the tension? Sacrifice of praise. You're worthy of praise. We're gonna worship you no matter what, but we're still gonna acknowledge where we're at in this tension that's still broken. I think each and every time that we press in and offer a sacrifice of praise, something supernatural happens. Why don't you turn to Acts 16? Hopefully you're already there. We'll turn to Acts chapter 16 and take a look at another story. This is our last picture of a sacrifice of praise I want to share with you this morning. Um, by now, and where we're at in Acts 16, it's about Oh, 20 or 25 years after the events I just read about in Jesus' life, one of, uh, one of the chief persecutors and prosecutors of the early church, a guy named Paul, who had overseen the killing of Christians because he believed they were against God, he has been confronted by Jesus and turns his life over to Jesus and lo and behold becomes a missionary, the best, biggest missionary. The reason you're sitting here today is because of Paul, because he took the gospel out of the, the Jewish culture and Jewish race and expanded it upon the Gentiles. By now he's gone to a city in Greece called Philippi. He begins to preach the gospel about Jesus in the marketplace and a young slave girl begins to harass him from behind and keeps yelling out to him. She's apparently uh, infiltrated by a territorial demon that has given her the ability to somewhat predict the future. Her slave owners use her to predict the future and make lots of money off her, selling her time so that she can give pronouncements to other people. At some point, Paul gets frustrated with this demonized girl harassing him and just turns around and rebukes the spirit of Python out of her, that's the spirit's name, and power is, is released by Jesus and this demon comes out of this slave girl. The slave owners are not happy because they had made a lot of money off the girl. And they have uh, Paul and Silas uh, brought to court on trumped up charges. They are beaten with rods and with whips. And then they are put in stocks where they sit on the ground and they're in stocks in the jailhouse sewer, the lowest place in the jail where all the sewers run. Not a happy place to be. Take a look at what happens. Verse 25, about midnight, maybe we better just pause there, about midnight. <laughs> How many of you have been at about midnight in your life at times? About midnight, friend of school betrays you and other friends gang up on you, it's about midnight. You choose to have a hard conversation with a conniving coworker because it's godly, it's biblical, and it's the right thing to do, and the situation blows up and you get written up. It's about midnight at that point. You finally take courage and have a vulnerable talk with your spouse about how they're neglecting you and they turn it around and pin it all on you. It's about midnight at that point. It's about midnight when the trainee goes out in the minivan, your hours get cut, and your child's diagnosed with a life-altering learning disability. It's about midnight at that point. How do you respond when it's about midnight? Verse 25, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and other prisoners were listening to them. I call that a sacrifice of praise. Your back is split wide open by rods and whips. You're sitting in a sewer. Your legs, you're cramping up because you're, you're sprawled out in the stocks and locked in them. That's a sacrifice of praise if you're in that moment. And, and the only thing wrong you did was cast a demon out of somebody while you're preaching the gospel. That's, if you're still praising at that point, that's a sacrifice of praise, right? All of a sudden... Verse 26, suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison door open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. Back then, if somebody escaped, the jailer paid the sentence of whoever escaped. 
So if they had 10 years left on their sentence, the jailer went to jail for 10 years. If it was a death sentence, they died. If a bunch of prisoners escaped, they just killed the guy and he just thought, I'd rather kill myself than go through what the Romans are going to put me through. But Paul said, he shouted, don't harm yourself, we are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Something truly supernatural happened as they offered a sacrifice of praise. The jailhouse shook, prison doors opened, all the chains fell off. Perhaps the most supernatural of all, the prisoners didn't run away. Um, they're still in their prison cells. So much supernatural power is released. The jailer says, what must I do to be saved? And if we had time, we could read. It goes on to say that uh, he and his whole family were baptized and saved. See, when you offer a great sacrifice of praise, great supernatural power is released. It can shake the chains off of you. It can open up the prison doors of the sins that have held you back bitterness, unforgiveness that have held you back. It can even lead to others around you saying, I want what you've got. How do I get saved? A great sacrifice of praise releases great supernatural power. Power to break the chains of depression, to break the powers of habitual sins, the chains of bitterness. Now I want to be careful here because it's easy to, to riff on this and to it makes a good sermon, like you can, you know. Um, how were Paul and Silas's backs after this? Bruised and bloodied. They didn't wake up the next day. They were released. Um, they were apologized to because they were Roman citizens, and Roman citizens aren't to be beaten without a proper trial. Um, they had rights. In fact, they weren't to be whipped with the cat of nine tails at all if you're a Roman citizen, and that's what happened to them. So they were released. They saw somebody get saved. Their chains fell off. They were given an apology the next day. But how were their backs? Still pretty sore. For weeks, I'm assuming. They didn't have Neosporin put on it, you know. No ibuprofen. There can still be pain. That's okay. Pain will get taken care of one day. What God is calling you and I to do is this. Will we worship him no matter what we're going through? He deserves worship no matter what. And if we are willing to do on earth what we can't do on he in heaven, which is to offer him a sacrifice of praise, if we are willing to do that, he inhabits the praises of his people and great supernatural power is released in those moments. Sometimes that supernatural power is simply the power to endure whatever you're going through. Sometimes the chains come off. Sometimes the prison doors open. Sometimes people who were against God fall to their knees and say, surely this is the real Jesus. Sometimes dead things come back to life. All the time, the supernatural power and presence of God is there when we're willing to offer a sacrifice of praise. How do you apply this to your life? Well, I'm going to encourage you this week that if you're in the midst, particularly if you're in the midst of a, it's an about midnight situation, then I want you to practice offering a, situa a sacrifice of praise. And you say, well, I, I'm not in a bad situation right now. Life's like dilly dilly. Well, you know, sometimes, you know, dilly dilly hits the fan, you know, so, uh, so practice and before that happens, Okay. I would encourage you to read Psalms 22 and to use it as your sacrifice of praise uh, scripture this week because you can lament on the first few verses and you'll see it just cycles through that he laments, then he acknowledges God's awesomeness, then he laments and acknowledges God's awesomeness. Um, begin to go through that. Yes, it's midnight. Yes, your back is sore from the beating and your arms and legs are store, sore from the stocks. And yes, there'll still be a stench in the air but like Paul and Silas in jail and Jesus on the cross, when we choose to offer a sacrifice of praise and expect God to meet us, to break our chains and to give us the strength to carry on, he will do those things. Your back will most likely hurt still like Paul and Silas's. 
But you'll no longer walk as the victim of your circumstances, but you will walk with the victor of your circumstances, Jesus Christ. And he will give you the power to walk through it and not just survive it, but thrive in it and for others to come to know Jesus through it. Great sacrifices of praise release great supernatural power, power to break chains of depression and habitual sins and bitterness. I'm gonna close with a story of what it looks like to offer a sacrifice of praise. I, uh, I, 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 didn't, I was not at the event I'm about to tell you about, but the day this event happened, I heard uh, from friends uh, that were there. It's back in February 1993, and I was at Kentucky Christian College, and um, uh, one of our sister schools, Cincinnati Bible College, um, they were, their girls' basketball team was playing a tournament in Battle Creek, Michigan, and on the way, the school van hit a patch of ice uh, that didn't see. And uh, the van veered off the road and rolled. And one of the passengers was thrown from the van, uh, named, uh, a girl named Jill uh, Rendell. And um, she was crushed by the van and, and killed. Jill was one of those gals, as I talked to people about her and as people told me about her during those days, because we had a close relationship. Uh, Jill's dad, Wally Rendell, was a pastor at Southern Acres Christian Church outside of Lexington, Kentucky. Wally uh, would preach at our, at our chapels quite often, a very good speaker and just passionate about Jesus. Jill was one of those gals. She was a talented athlete, uh, just all around all-star, friendly, engaging, and deeply spiritual. She simply did everything right, everybody said. She had been elected homecoming queen four days before the accident, and when news began to spread, somebody told Wally, her dad said, now the queen has gone on to meet her king. Jill left behind a mom and a dad, Wally and Barbara, and her twin sister, Jody. Now, like I said, Jill's dad, Wally, was a well-respected pastor at Southern Acres. Um, I didn't know the family, but I saw Wally uh, several times and speak, and I'd heard this story back then, but this week I, I called my friend Louis Weber, who we'd been, he was a professor at the time at the college, and we'd since grown to be best friends over all these years, and I called him to, to have him recount the story once again. He said the funeral was well-planned, about as well-planned of a funeral, just all the perfect pieces came together very well, but he said there was just a sense of heaviness in the air, deep grief, and, and not just like little boo-hoos, but deep weeping throughout the congregation as the, as the uh, funeral went on. And he said you could just feel it in the air, this overwhelming grief of how does this happen to such a great girl and to such a great family and just the tragedy and quickness and suddenness of it all. Near the end of the funeral, they played uh, Jill's favorite worship song and, and I tried to find this week what that was and I tried to even remember because I used to know back in February 93, but I've since forgotten. Um, they played her favorite song and he said, there's just deep grief happening in the room and grief outbursts. In the middle of the song, everybody's seated. Wally and Barbara, mom and dad, stand up. Conservative Church of Christ's folks who not used to displays in worship in 93, but they stood up and raised their hands and they began to worship God just feet from their daughter's casket. As Louis tells the story about a great sacrifice of praise on the phone to me this week, he, he breaks it down and says, oh God, I can feel the presence of God as I'm sitting in my room right now telling you the story. He said in that moment, it was as if a holy hush came on the room and the supernatural comfort and presence of God entered well, still hurting, still grieving, but there was an atmospheric change that after a great sacrifice of praise was offered, the God who inhabits the praises of his people showed up. The father of all compassion who comforts us in our times of trial so we may comfort others, as Paul would put it in 2 Corinthians 1. That happened in the room. Such a great sacrifice of praise, like I said, that as Louis is telling me the story on the phone this week, once again, the presence of God shows up with him as he sits in a nursing home. That's what happens when we offer God a great sacrifice of praise. 
in that case, the power of that event still resonated 25 years later. Today, I want to give you the opportunity to offer God a sacrifice of praise. Ryan's going to come up and lead us in worship. I want you to stand right where you're at. Just begin to stand. And let's invite the presence of God to come. And let's even, you may have to, in fact, you won't, I, I strike the word may, you will have to decide that I'm going to worship God no matter what. So right where you're at right now, just to begin to be intentional. Whether today's a great day for you or a hard day, it's been a great week or a rough week, right where you're at, just begin to say, God, you deserve praise. And I'm giving you a sacrifice of praise right now in this moment. In fact, you don't even have to wait for for music. You can just begin right where you're at just to go, okay, God, I praise you. I'm going to praise you in the storm. My back hurts from the beating. My heart hurts from the mocking. Arms and legs hurt from the stocks I've been in. But I choose to praise you no matter what right now. Come Holy Spirit, more of you. Lift up those who feel crucified, those who feel beat up. I pray you'd begin to draw them right now. Begin to draw them, woo their hearts and say, will you offer a sacrifice of praise no matter how you feel? I pray you'd begin to open their eyes that they would begin to focus on the awesomeness of their God, his holiness, his majesty, his love, his affections, his, his sacrifice. And that would compel them. I'm not going to focus on my trials. I'm going to focus on Jesus and offer him a sacrifice of praise and trust him with the outcome. Let's begin to worship.